It is Tuesday, June 22nd at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, and you are in the right place at the right time for the emergency nationwide webcast, Stopping Death by Mail, Big Abortions, Big Secret. We are in the midst of a crisis at this very moment. Political leaders are currently pressuring the Food and Drug Administration to make it easier to sell death by mail, literally politicizing medicine to advance the interests and the profits of big abortion. If they are successful, this would increase the number of abortions across the United States by the millions. But tonight, you are going to learn exactly what you can do to help prevent this from happening. I want to be the first to officially welcome you and the flood of participants who are joining us from all across America and far beyond. My name is David B. Wright, and I will be serving as the host for our online event tonight. And perhaps we met in my previous role as the founder and former CEO of 40 Days for Life, or maybe we met as I've spoken at in-person pro-life events across all 50 states and dozens of countries, or one of the many online events I've conducted with thousands or tens of thousands of participants. Or maybe this is the very first time that we've met, in which case I'm so glad to be able to connect with you here tonight around such an important cause. And tonight you're going to be hearing from many, many more voices than merely mine. You're going to learn from some of the nation's top leaders and experts on the topic that we will be dealing with tonight. You'll be hearing from Kristen Hawkins, president of Students for Life and Students for Life Action, and Charlotte Pence Bond, filmmaker and daughter of Vice President Mike Pence. You'll hear from Jorel Godsey, president of Heartbeat International, as well as U.S. Representative Chip Roy from Texas and U.S. Representative Mary Miller from Illinois. Tonight, you'll also be learning from Dr. Brent Bowles, the medical director at Heartbeat International, Dr. Christina Francis, chairman of the board for APLOG, the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as Denise Harrell. She serves as the senior counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, Tina Whittington, the Vice President of Students for Life, Christy Hamrick, Chief Media Strategist for Students for Life, and Brooke Paz, who works in Government Affairs for Students for Life Action. So here's what's at stake in the topic that we're going to be diving deeply into during this urgent webcast. Prior to last year's elections, the abortion industry was caught red-handed when one of their top secret internal strategy documents was leaked it was a document called the Reproductive Health Investors Alliance document. And it was an overview, a 94-page document outlining the entire abortion industry's multi-year strategy across all 50 states of how they were going to expand abortion in a way that would hurt more women and end the lives of more children. One of the shocking revelations from that document was that the abortion industry recognized a weak link in their model. And that was the traditional abortion clinic. And they realized that to overcome this weakness, this constraint, they needed to dramatically raise funds to expand the use of chemical abortions. Also, they indicated the desire to continually lower the level of medical providers who would be prescribing these deadly drugs, and they described their intent to make abortion pills available through telemedicine, and yes, even mail order, literally death by mail. Well, now Planned Parenthood and the rest of the abortion industry have elevated their closest allies to the highest positions of power in our land, and they're demanding that their deadly schemes now be foisted upon the American public. Within months, the Biden administration, the pro-abortion administration we are currently suffering under, their FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is expected to announce the removal of all health and safety standards required for the sale and distribution of chemical abortion pills, also known as RU486. During the COVID-19 crisis, abortion advocates and activists applied their political and legal pressure to allow and expand death by mail. They claimed it was too risky for women to be seen in an office to even receive these deadly drugs. What Big Abortion failed to mention was that these pills are 100% deadly to children, but also many times deadly to women. Well, Students for Life is leading the charge and the pro-life movement is rallying and mobilizing to confront the impending devastation to stop this death by mail in its tracks. And if you stay with us throughout this webcast, we're going to be sharing with you a cutting edge new free tool 
to combat this evil effectively, and it will actually be premiered at the end of our broadcast here tonight. So let's get started with our first segment, our first panel. Numerous influential pro-life leaders and groups rallied together recently to assemble and create a groundbreaking new resource to help you and me and all of America understand how bad chemical abortion really is. And you tonight are going to discover this brand new resource. So to lead us in the first portion of our conversation tonight, let me hand things over to my longtime friend and tireless pro-life advocate and leader, Kristen Hawkins, who serves as president of Students for Life of America and Students for Life Action. Kristen, over to you. Thank you, David, so much for that kind introduction. Um, And I am so excited to be with you all this evening to talk about what's coming down the pike and this big secret that big abortion has. And joining me tonight in this segment, I'm so honored to have Jarrell Godsey, the president of Harpy International, and also Charlotte Pence Bond. She's a filmmaker, and you probably saw her on TV or with her dad and her mom at various functions in Washington, D.C. over the past few years. Um, but we have a lot to talk about tonight, guys, So, and we only have a few minutes to do it. So I want to dig right into what we're seeing happening in Washington, D.C., which is why we're having this urgent webcast. Um, Drell, can you kind of explain to everyone what is happening right now in in the pro-life movement and what we're seeing coming down from President Biden's administration in Washington and why why this is going to be a game changer for our movement that can result in millions more lost? Sure, Kristen. It's one of the scary things. We've been working with an abortion pill reversal and abortion pill reversal network. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things we're seeing with the changes that the Biden administration, it's basic, they're basically poised to unleash chemical abortion upon the entire nation. There's been a slow, steady build towards chemical abortion since President Clinton back in the 90s kind of foisted this upon uh, the U.S. population. It started small. It's been growing. There are some challenges that arose early on, but slowly and steadily, the abortion industry has kind of been testing, proving, moving towards this because, frankly, it's more profitable. It's uh, it's easier to accomplish. It allows them to, to really spread the De- you know, death by pills across uh, vast portions of our country that would otherwise be protected by good pro-life laws. And so with the last thing that was been holding on is the FDA regulations, which is called REMS, uh, Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy that we know has been in place since the beginning, even, even when it was approved uh, at Clinton's behest, it was mm-hmm. really approved with the caveat that every woman should be evaluated, should have a chance to meet the doctor face to face. And so all of that was put into place because of women's care, caring for women, because mm-hmm. there are dangers involved with this. That's why there is a REMS to begin with. And yet uh, mm-hmm. COVID came and what we saw was, was COVID was used by the abortion industry to kind of unlock some things in an emergency basis that was done for COVID and uh, for the sake of big abortion, not for sake of women, mind you, but for the sake of abortion. And now what we're seeing is that what we believe is about to happen is that the Biden administration is going to use, to have the FDA unlock this permanently. So it will no longer be kind of a temporary reality, but it'll mm-hmm. be a permanent reality, which will unleash chemical abortion on the land and untold challenges that we'll be facing. This is, uh, it's simply unbelievable because especially when you think about the abortion industry and the rhetoric that we hear from them time and time again, you know, this is between a woman and her doctor, safe, legal, and rare. I mean, and and what we're hearing and what you're saying is coming down um, from Washington, D.C., from the abortion lobby, who's now apparently, you know, lockstep with the Biden administration, is it's not about a woman and her doctor, um, because with COVID, with the COVID pandemic, what we saw, I think in say Montana, we were on a call and students were going to the Planned Parenthood website where they were just distributing these dangerous chemical abortion pills without even a woman going to confirm that she's pregnant, without ever like walking into a doctor's office using COVID-19 as the excuse to just death by mail, you know, mail her these drugs um, and hope nothing goes wrong. I mean, it, it's 
It's unbelievable because it's so counter to everything they're saying. And I and I know Tina Whittington, our vice president of Students Wife, is going to be go- coming on soon in this webcast, and we're going to be going over with some uh, doctors about just how dangerous these chemical abortion pills really are. Um, not only do they end a life a life of a human being every single time they're consumed, but they actually jeopardize the lives of women. Um, Jarell, I found so found interesting a couple of months ago out of Washington DC there was a letter not a lot of people knew about it this wasn't covered by mainstream media which is why we're having this webcast tonight um but in the letter it was a a president Biden appointee there at, at FDA and she was actually arguing for dropping these REMS um risk evaluation mitigation strategies hopefully I said that right yep. um but I recognized her name from like years ago when I believe she actually advocated for the reps. Is that true? And what changed? Well, that's my understanding. Remember, this is like so many other things that kind of get foisted upon the uh, American people is in order to get it to get it approved to begin with. We, we want to have all of the safeguards in place. We want to make sure it's done properly. It's done carefully. Mm-hmm. And, but suddenly, now that it's in place, it's now no longer, we no longer need to be careful. And careful with what, actually, Kristen? Careful with, of course, women's lives, the, yeah. what women are facing. And, and the, the abortion industry continues to kind of pr- uh, position a chemical abortion as a simple procedure. It's it's uh, it's not it's not a problem. It's very simple. You take medication. In fact, they call it medication abortion or medical abortion. Well, lots of things are medical. There's lots of medications, mm-hmm. but but none of them, almost none of them, it's statistically mm-hmm. require REMS or have required that to be the case. Yeah. And yet and yet the FDA is moving. Now this is not this is not new in, in total because the ACLU sued to have the FDA REMS removed a few years ago. So it's not like this is new, but what's happened, COVID has really accelerated this Mm -hmm. path. And of course, an administration that is totally beholding to big abortion is simply paving the way for uh, big abortion to take it. And by the way, I don't think this is just going to be an issue for uh, 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 really the big abortion in the U.S. because we, we know that we see uh, mm-hmm. These pills are being are being pushed by uh, companies in India and in China. I mean, pretty soon we're having we're going to have the flood of these pills in our in our market if we if we have an administration that won't even stand up for the sake of women and women's health care. That's unbelievable, um, and it's so frustrating because it's it's what do we do? You know, mm-hmm. we can obviously vote pro life first, and I think Charlotte probably could have speak for days about the importance of voting pro life first. Um, Maybe you don't want to, and you're like, no more voting talk ever again. But, I mean, we we can vote, but now we're stuck right now with the most pro-abortion administration in the history of America. I mean, even more pro-abortion than President Obama. If you look at appointees like Javier Becerra, who's now the head of HHS, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, the de facto head of the FDA, which is the, you know, the governing bodies making these decisions. This isn't a bill that we can stop. This is this is a mandate that's coming down from President Biden's administration. And so I think it's so frustrating to be sitting here as a pro-life activist saying, well, what do we do? Do we just, you know, start training people, building our war chest for, you know, the 2024 election? Like, what can we do right now? And I think that's what's so um, exciting about what this new tool that we have to kind of premiere to the pro-life movement tonight is because I think it's something that it's not a be all end all solution, but this is a great tool for us to use to educate ourselves in the pro-life movement, get spread the word of what's happening in Washington, DC, which I think will lead to a domino effect throughout America. Um, so I'm so excited about this new tool to share with you all. Uh, Charlotte, I don't want to spill the beans anymore. Tell us, what what are, what are we talking about? What's this kind of <laughs> free new tool that everyone in the pro life movement um, can utilize that we're releasing tonight, which is why we're having the webcast? Yeah, it's really exciting, Kristen. Um, I'm super pumped. These we've made basically five videos um, that people can watch, and so they're free. Everybody can check them out. Um, you can go to thisischemicalabortion.com. Um, I'm telling people to share them, not only watch them, but share them with people. Um, mm-hmm. And they really explain, 
not only what chemical abortion, mm-hmm. the abortion pill is, but they also explain um, how it's going to affect your community potentially, how it affects people on a personal level, which I really liked. I mean, we talked to women who have um, taken the abortion pill. Um, we talked to doctors who have um, helped women go through the abortion pill reversal process and, uh, you know, successfully um, had healthy babies born um, after that. And so that was one of the most uh, amazing things I found out kind of doing these videos with you guys was kind of seeing that process because mm. even being in the pro-life movement for a while, I I didn't know that much about abortion pill reversal. And I'm really excited to kind of share that side of it because I think mm. um, the more people that know about that, you know, then there's a greater chance that if somebody does have regrets mm. after taking that first pill, they can reach out um, to mm. the abortion pill reversal network and uh, potentially save the life of their unborn child. Mm. Yeah. So what we're releasing tonight is this is chemical abortion. It's a five part docu series produced by our very own Charlotte Pence Bond. Um, Students for Life, Harp International partnered on this effort. And we need to get this docu series far and wide, which is why we all we all need your all's help to, as what Charlotte said, share this. Don't just watch the video. If you go to this is chemical abortion dot com. Obviously, watch the five videos. They're short mini episodes. They Mm. are loaded with facts, with science. I love how those on the other side try to act like they are pro-science when every single day when they advocate for abortion, they're denying science. These are science fact-filled, you know, short docu-series that you can share on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter to not only educate your pro-choice family and friends about the dangers of chemical abortion, the hope of chemical abortion reversal, the abortion pill reversal network, which Harpy International leads the uh, Mm -hmm. effort on has saved, you know, probably hundreds of lives right now. Thousands. Thousands thousands of lives. Um, We, it's, it's unbelievable. We get contacted all the time by students who've taken that first pill and it's, what do I do? I, you know, I'm instantly regretting this decision. It's called the abortion pill reversal network. Um, so you're going to learn about that. You're going to learn about this, just the dangerous nature of these drugs. Um, not only how they end preborn human lives, but how they can end the lives of mothers. And we're also talking this docu series about what's happening in Washington, how these, you know, REM guidelines are being changed, how big abortion um, is, is, is working with the Biden administration. Uh, and this is a story that you're not really going to hear. It, it's, it's a secret and it pretty much an open secret in Washington. So I really mm-hmm. hope you all will um, go to this is chemical abortion.com. Check out Charlotte's videos, share them across the pro-life movement uh, and to every pro-choice person, you know, basically every American needs to see them. And right now we're going to show a clip, just a short 30 second promo of the docuseries. So you can get a little taste of what's in store. What I see from the abortion industry is that they're lying to women. We have heard stories about these girls and not knowing what to do with these babies, but they were told, just keep flushing, just keep flushing. If you're an advocate for choice, why don't you respect the choice when she decides she's made a mistake and she chooses to try to reverse it? Because you're not an advocate for choice, you're not an advocate for women, you're an advocate for abortion. Thank you so much, Kristen and Jorel, as well as Charlotte. And now you've gotten a glimpse of this powerful new docu-series. It's going to blow the cover of Big Abortion's Big Secret. And yes, the entire video series will premiere for the very first time anywhere right at the end of our webcast tonight, if you're able to stay on after the discussion to watch these groundbreaking videos. We're also gonna let you know how to access these game-changing videos following tonight's event so you can share them with so many others around you. But now let's shift our focus. Let's understand exactly how these dangerous chemical abortion pills kill, and also understand how the law is being manipulated to sell them. To set up this next panel, let's hear from Tina Whittington, co-producer of the video series and also vice president of Students for Life, Tina. Hey, that was such an awesome promo, and we can't wait to show you the full video in just a few short minutes. But before we do, we're gonna talk uh, about some of the science behind chemical abortion. And we have some great 
guests joining me who are experts in their fields. And I'm really excited. I got to work with them on the creation of the uh, docu-series that we're going to uh, show you. And um, they're really great people. So I'm excited to introduce Dr. Brent Bowles. He's a board certified OBGYN with over 20 years of private practice experience. And he is the medical director for the Abortion Pill Reversal Network. And then we have Dr. Christina Francis. She's a board certified OBGYN who currently works as an OBGYN hospitalist. And then she also serves as the chairman of the board for the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Big words. Then we can't go anywhere without our attorneys. So we also have with us Denise Harley, who serves as senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom, where she's a member of the Center for Life. And she's actually currently working on legal issues regarding chemical abortion. So welcome, you guys. Thank you. Thank you for, Thank you for coming. So uh, we had a lot of fun filming, um, and I just want to give some of the highlights to the people watching tonight. Uh, many people don't know that more than 40% of abortions are now committed by using chemical abortion pills. Um, they also are not aware that these drugs are deadly. Obviously, for the preborn, that's the purpose of this chemical cocktail is to end the life of the child in the womb. But it can also be harmful to the moms who take these pills. So Dr. Bowles, I just wanted to bring you, we understand that chemical abortion has four times the complications of a surgical abortion. And I just want to know, can you explain the real harm and risk these drugs carry to the women who use them? Well, the, the statistics are complicated because the other side tries to mislead people continually on, on the safety of abortion, medication abortion or surgical abortion. And what the public needs to understand is that there is no way to support the, the conclusions that they make based on the real data. The objective, rational observer would not agree with the points that they make. You know, we hear abortion is 14 times safer than childbirth. We hear uh, medication abortion is safer than Tylenol, safe by all measures. Former Planned Parenthood uh, CEO Cecile Richards said exactly that in an op-ed to the LA Times in 2018. Medication abortion is safe by all measures, safer than Tylenol. How do you come to such a conclusion? If you want to make an accurate conclusion about abortion safety across the board, you have to have comprehensive and accurate statistics, and no such database exists in the United States. Only 28 states have a requirement to report complications and deaths from abortion to the CDC. And there's no enforcement mechanism in any of those 28 states that ensures compliance. The other 22 states don't even pretend to report anything. They report nothing about complications or about deaths from abortion. And those 22 states, the minority of states, perform more than 50% of the abortions in the country, and they have more than 50% of the abortion clinics in the country. So a minority of states performing a majority of the procedures and having the majority of the clinics report nothing. So where do these numbers come from? Uh, they almost come out of thin air because you can't compare complications from childbirth, which is comprehensively reported. Maternal mortality is comprehensively reported by law in all 50 states to the CDC, and abortion mortality and complications are not. So how do you compare the two? You cannot. But the papers where they talk about abortion safety do exactly that. They compare those two statistics. And even the CDC says, and I'm quoting a CDC physician, abortion statistics and maternal mortality statistics are two different measures used for two different purposes. So we're being misled when we're told that the complication rate from abortions is less than 1% and medication abortion is safer than Tylenol, you, you have to have comprehensive, accurate data. And data like that does exist. For example, a study from Finland uh, looked at women who had abortions, either medication or surgical, under the gestational age of nine weeks between the years 2000 and 2006. This study looked at more than 42,000 women, didn't exclude anyone who had an abortion. And they register, they record, they report that 5% of surgical abortions under nine weeks have at least one immediate adverse event. 
medication abortions under nine weeks, 20% have at least one immediate adverse event. So the best data that exists anywhere in the world talking about the safety of medication abortions says that 20% of the women who have them under nine weeks will have at least one immediate complication, and that's four times as great as surgical abortions. Yet we hear that it's safe, that it's more, that it's so important that women avoid a potential COVID exposure. But if you break those statistics down, the chances of them dying from a ruptured ectopic that was missed because they did a mail-order murder abortion is probably higher than the chance of dying from COVID that you pick up at an abortion clinic for a reproductive age woman. It, it's, it makes no sense. It also completely ignores good data from England that within just a few weeks of legalizing mail-order abortion across the country, the number of women requiring an ambulance transport to a hospital for emergency care immediately after a medication abortion doubled. Mm. So you can't say it's safe. You simply cannot. But they do because those sound bites sound good. What is a sound bite? A sound bite is something that you can repeat with no more brain power than a parrot uses when it repeats what it's heard. And that's all those things are. That's all they have when it comes to safety. Mm-hmm. So what is like maybe the top three risks? Is it bleeding? You, you mentioned uh, rupture. What, what's going on there that, that women like are mostly experiencing when it comes to adverse complications? Well, a great study that just came out earlier this year from the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs looked at more than 6,000 adverse event reports that had been filed with the FDA. We weeded out the duplicates, uh, narrowed it down to the ones that had enough data to evaluate and still had around 2,500 adverse event reports to look at. Mm -hmm. And the most common things were hemorrhage, Mm -hmm. excessive bleeding, ectopic pregnancies that were misdiagnosed, and infection. And when mm-hmm. you do a mail order abortion and your 50% of those women are going to be wrong on their gestational age, half of those are going to be farther along than they think at greater risk for bleeding and mm-hmm. incomplete passage and infection. And 50% of women with an ectopic have no risk factor that you can pull out in a Skype interview. Um, mm-hmm. 50% of the ectopics that exist will be missed. And those are the probably the three greatest risks. Mm-hmm. And mail-order abortion increases the risk that a woman will have issues with all three of those things. Interesting. And so we've heard in this last year a lot of talk about the REMS. So we hear all these risks that are involved with chemical abortion. And it's been the FDA's responsibility to kind of protect, I guess, the consumer Uh, the clients that are going in seeking different medicines or surgeries or whatever, they create uh, REMS, which is the restrictions, risk mitigation strategies. I'm probably getting that wrong. Um, So that when women come in for certain kinds of medicines or treatments, um, they are going to experience the least amount of risk. And so right now we're seeing something where the abortion industry is pushing for these restrictions, REMS to be removed. So like what you said, Dr. Bowles, that women can obtain these medicines without a doctor's visit uh, through the mail, like you said. So I'm just curious, uh, Dr. Francis, what are the dangers? And maybe you can even explain, because I probably didn't do a good job of what REMS is, but explain what it is. And then what happens if we remove these? um, and, And what does that do to the greater be harm that could be caused, sort of like what Dr. Bowles was saying about these mail order abortions? Yeah, well, it, you know, it's a great question. And it's important for people to understand that what the abortion industry is doing through pushing for these REMS to be lifted is an absolute attack on women's health in this country. And really, women all over the country should be up in arms about this, because they are attacking Um, the safety, uh, the minimal safety that does exist to govern the use of these medications, which Dr. Bowles did a great job of explaining, going through the data that we have that that they're not safe, but at least we're minimizing the damage through keeping them um, supervised through medical supervision. So like you said, the REMS, that stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. And it's it's a strategy that the FDA employs 
for only a very few number of medications that are on the market, medications that are known to have significant side effects. And so the REMS are put into place to try to minimize the side effects and maximize the quote unquote benefit. Now for most medications, those are gonna have a benefit. As we all know, for the chemical abortion medications, they don't have any benefit, but the REMS are there to minimize the side effects and the adverse events that women go through. And a big part of the REMS is that it requires that a woman be seen in person by a physician or another healthcare provider to screen her for many things, to do an ultrasound, to confirm her gestational age or confirm that her pregnancy is actually inside the uterus, not in the tube, something that we call an ectopic pregnancy or somewhere else outside of the uterus. And as Dr. Bowles referenced, ectopic pregnancies are something that still kill women, even in the U.S., even with our excellent medical care that we have in the U.S., this is something that still leads to the death of women. And the really scary thing about women not being screened for this is that the symptoms of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy are the exact same as the symptoms that a woman experiences when she's undergoing a chemical abortion. And so women are told when they go home, you're going to have bleeding and you're going to have pain and the pain might be a lot and it's okay. That's normal. Just take the pain medication, you know, and stay at home. So if a woman is not screened properly, which the American College of OBGYN will say that you can screen a woman for ectopic pregnancy just by asking her about symptoms and risk factors. Any practicing OBGYN knows that that is not the case. Anyone who has seen a woman with an ectopic pregnancy will know that the vast majority of them have no symptoms and no risk factors, but yet they have that ectopic pregnancy. And so if she's sent home and she thinks that these symptoms she's experiencing are just because of the, the medications that she's taken to induce an abortion and she bleeds into her abdomen and she has that pain, but she thinks it's normal and she just stays at home, she's going to die. And this has happened. This is part of those adverse event reports that Dr. Bowles was referencing because women had undiagnosed ectopic pregnancies. So that's one of the main dangers. Also, the American College of OBGYNs or ACOG admits that 50% of women will be wrong about their last menstrual period. So they'll be wrong about how far along they are in their pregnancy. And that the best way, in fact, I'm quoting one of their own documents, that a pregnancy that does not have an ultrasound to confirm the dating prior to 22 weeks of pregnancy is considered suboptimally dated, meaning even ACOG acknowledges that if you don't have an ultrasound to confirm gestational age, it's not a, you don't have good dates for that pregnancy. And the reason that that's important is because we know that the side effects that are associated with chemical abortions start to increase significantly after about eight weeks of pregnancy, but then at about 10 weeks, they really start to skyrocket. And so if a woman in her second trimester takes these medications, her risk of needing a surgery to complete her abortion is as high as 40%. Not only will she need an emergency surgery to complete her abortion, but she's at huge risk for a massive hemorrhage that can lead to, um, in the worst case, loss of her life, but certainly the need for multiple blood, uh, blood product transfusions. The other reason why that's important so in the second trimester, up to 40% of women may need surgical completion. In the first trimester, anywhere from on the low estimates, 8%, on the high estimates, 20% of women will need a surgery to complete their abortion. In those women that start out their abortion with medication and have to be completed with surgery, their risk of preterm birth in future pregnancies, possibly pregnancies that are desired, um, their risk of very preterm birth, meaning really premature babies, increases by 300%. So not only are we placing women in danger when they initially take their the, the chemical abortion pills, but we're also placing them in danger and their future children in danger as well. So women need to be aware of these risks. Finally, the last reason why uh, these REMs are important uh, actually, two more reasons. One is because we know that upwards of 60 plus percent of women say that they were pressured into their abortion decision. If a woman is sitting at a computer talking to a physician, what if her boyfriend or her trafficker, if she's a sex trafficking victim, is standing off screen and glaring at her to continue this process of getting her abortion? That physician has no way of knowing that that's going on. But if you're seeing that patient in your office and you're talking to her one-on-one, -on -one, there's the possibility, not that it's always done by the abortion industry, but there's the possibility at least of screening for coercion for that patient. And finally, if these REMs are lifted, 
these pills, there's nothing stopping them from going over the counter, which is what we're already seeing, right? We're already seeing these websites popping up where women can just order them through online. They can get them through the mail. As Dr. Bowles said, they've done this in the UK and they've had significant problems. If that happens, all of these laws that we all have worked so hard together in every state across the country to pass that regulate abortion, that improve safety for women, all of those laws basically will be moot because now all of a sudden abortion can be, ta- be obtained through the mail over the internet. And not only then are more children going to die, but we're going to see uh, exponentially more women harmed or even killed by these dangerous medications. It's amazing to me because we obviously as pro-lifers, we know the purpose of this drug is to end the life of an innocent, unique, living, whole human being. And that's why we oppose it. But it's remarkable to me that we're not on the same side as maybe those that wouldn't be on our side with abortion for women's health. And and that, you know, there would be this kind of push when we see that there are actual harms, that there are statistics and studies out there showing that, you know, it is uh, harmful, even up to like leading to death for women. And yet the FDA is complicit in removing the REMS um, and pushing this forward. There's a definitely something, the government, political, I don't know, Denise, can you speak into maybe what's the legal ramifications of this? Um, and, and has our government been playing political games with women's health on this? Yeah, Tina, what we've seen is really an abuse of the laws and the legal process and the legal system, all of it twisted in favor of the abortion industry. So as one example, during the COVID crisis, big corporate abortion and all their political allies fought to drop all the health and safety standards on chemical abortions to allow for um, women to go through you know, with, without any sort of physician examination to have just an untested, unsafe distribution of chemical abortion pills, which as as the doctors have explained is extremely risky and serves no purpose to advance a woman's health or safety. Um, it's it's truly malpractice, I would say. Um, as, as a non-doctor, it's, it's certainly a malpractice type behavior. Um, and at the same time, ironically, the abortion industry was demanding that during COVID, they would be deemed legally essential services so they could keep their clinics open, so they could keep performing surgical abortions. So on the one hand, they said, oh, no, there's no way women can risk getting COVID to come in to you know, get a proper examination by doctor. And then on the other hand, they were saying, absolutely, we must stay open regardless of the pandemic risk. And so... You, that's just an example of how big abortion uses the laws to uh, to whatever suits their purposes of maximizing their profit and concern for good health care is not um, is not one of the factors that they're considering. Then you have politicians like the California former California Attorney General Javier Becerra, who is now Biden's head of HHS. And he's been applying legal pressure to get the medical standards reduced for women. Uh, he was a very big pro-abortion advocate in California, and he now oversees the FDA as head of HHS. Um, And this is the same FDA that he sued to try to make chemical abortion pills easier to hand out without any provisions for women's safety. And now he is the fox guarding the hen house there. So, you know, I think another example people might remember is when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was linked to one death um, from the vaccine, the vaccine was pulled, the FDA put it on hold. And yet we have chemical abortion and we know of at least a couple dozen deaths to women that have occurred directly as a result of chemical abortion. And yet, um, you know, the FDA seems to be going in the complete opposite direction of wanting to just make it as available as possible by mail, on the internet, without even, you know, really seeing a doctor, without even confirming how far along you are or if your pregnancy is ectopic. Um, and it's it's not the way that the laws are, and our agencies that implement regulations are supposed to be operating. They're supposed to be, you know, the government's role is to protect the health and safety and welfare of the citizens. And yet, when it comes to abortion, we see this completely different approach. And it's, you know, in my view, it's really politics poisoning the debate. Um, 
politics manipulating the laws and legal system and the whole reason we have these public policies. And it's ending up putting women's lives at risk just to satisfy the abortion lobby. For sure. I, I agree. Uh, one of uh, the people on our team always says if your uh, medicine or if your uh, if your if your ah, medical attention is killing people, you're doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> you know that if your health care is killing people, you're doing it wrong. But like you're right. There is this attitude of um, abortion is the sacred cow and everything has to fall before that including women's health. And I think it's so great to have you guys on and talk about this stuff because people just don't know. And I'm always surprised by uh, just the lack of understanding of chemical abortion. I think it's partly it's just pro-lifers were so used to being outside the abortion facility and stopping a woman from having a surgical abortion. Um, but really, this is the new frontier, isn't it? I mean, that's for anyone. This is the new frontier. Well, and so for us, it, it's hard as the average person to figure out how do I make a difference in this? And so there are a couple ways that you can make a difference as just that person sitting at home tonight watching this. One is when this series comes out, share it. Because like we've been saying, people just don't know. They've been lied to, manipulated, um, politically manipulated. Um, and so share it. Let other people know. But then the other thing you can do is go and sign our petition to the FDA. Because we can hold on to these REMS that will do some good in holding back um, the scourge of this kind of mail order chemical abortion coming into people's homes, harming women, ending more and more lives of the precious preborn. So you can head to thisischemicalabortion.com to take action. I encourage you to open up another screen on your computer so you don't log out of this um, and go ahead and thisischemicalabortion.com, take action, sign the petition. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm going to bump it back to David. Thank you so much, Tina, as well as Dr. Francis, Dr. Bowles, and Denise. And now let's begin moving toward exactly what you and I can do. How can we be part of the solution to this chemical abortion crisis? So for this portion of the discussion, let me turn the floor over to Brooke Paz, who works in Government Affairs for Students for Life Action, and she will be talking with U.S. Congressman Chip Roy. Brooke. Thank you, David, for that great introduction. Congressman Roy, thank you so much for joining us tonight to talk about this incredibly important and timely issue. I'm sure Americans are now outraged to find that we can literally send deadly chemical abortion pills by mail to anyone across the country and that these pills could have major health repercussions to women and minors. We have a petition calling on the Biden administration's FDA to put science over politics and support women's safety at thisischemicalabortion.com. We're also calling on Congress to hold the FDA accountable and pass laws that prohibit reckless distribution of these deadly drugs. The SAVE Act is one approach. Congressman Roy, what got you interested in this issue? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on and thanks for y'all's leadership on this. It's so critically important. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that is most troubling is how uh, easy uh, this uh, effort by the left in order to push these chemical abortion uh, tools out to our younger population, how easy that is to uh, not be understood in terms of the dangers that that poses to women's health. We, those of us who are uh, in favor of protecting life, uh, you know, we're all out there advocating for the unborn all the time. And often lost in that from the left is the danger posed to women's health, both physically and mentally. And so one of the things that I thought was critically important was for us to address this, particularly at universities and colleges. Uh, where, unfortunately, taxpayer funds are being used to, you know, allow universities to be able to dole uh, the chemical uh, abortion tools out to these young uh, ladies. And I think we ought to stop that. I think we shouldn't allow that. And so I've introduced legislation uh, to try to prohibit the use of federal dollars unless uh, colleges and universities certify they're not using that uh, to, for those purposes. And, you know, I've been interested in the life issue for a long time, but it hit home when my godson, uh, who's a, a healthy young boy today, uh, his mom uh, told his her, her OBGYN to pound sand when her OB said that uh, she should abort him because a scan came up a little uh, funky showing that his brains weren't, the sides of the brains weren't going to talk to each other properly. 
and basically was just saying, hey, go get an abortion. She, she's very pro-life and she held the line. And now we've got a beautiful boy as your godson. And and so it really hit home for me personally. That's wonderful to hear. And we really appreciate you taking the initiative on this issue. It's so important. Now, not all Americans have as amazing representatives as you, Congressman. How can people get involved, make an impact, make their voices heard? Well, certainly you got to reach out to all of your representatives, but you yourself get out and, and get the word out. Uh, one of the things people don't understand is they think this is just some sort of little sideshow, but I, you know, upwards, it's been an 800% or something increase in the use of uh, chemical uh, abortions. And, and that's really troubling. And I think uh, if you think, I think now maybe a third of all abortions are done uh, that way. And I think expressing to people at the kitchen table and in your communities how this works and what happens and that there's significant, you know, hundreds, thousands of young women who have had health complications as a result of it. It's not just simply, you know, taking a pill and walking away, that it does things to, to a young woman's body. I think informing your, your communities is really important, but also get on the horn with your legislators. Let them know that the FDA can take steps to stop this, to uh, have risk mitigation in order to allow people to understand what's actually going on. And for us to actually pass legislation that matters, whether it's the SAVE Act or whether it's uh, my legislation, which is Protecting Life on College Campuses Act. So I think these are things that everybody can get involved and do. And, uh, and of course, support uh, politicians who stand for life and will do the right thing. If I do nothing else for humanity, uh, beating Wendy Davis, by seven percentage points and by 30,000 votes with the help of the life community last year uh, is the, is my one big service to, to my great country. But now going forward, let's advance the ball for life. And that means getting involved and getting the right people elected. But, but that first part is the most important. Get your community to understand what we're talking about. And then I think that will help uh, move the ball. Absolutely. It's a bit of an uphill battle. We know that the Biden administration is the most pro-choice, the most pro-abortion that we this country has probably ever seen. So uh, we really appreciate pro-life champions like you joining these efforts, fighting the good fight, despite all the opposition on the Hill. So thank you very much, Congressman Roy, and thank you for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Now, to it's... Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's not too late to help women. We need to, at the very least, keep the health and safety standards for chemical abortion. Those are called REMS. Even though for those who support abortion, which we don't, getting rid of these health and safety standards because the abortion industry doesn't want to be bothered is political payback. It's not health care. So stay on to watch the docuseries in full and then head to thisiscemicalabortion.com to share. But before you do that, we have one friend who couldn't join us tonight. U.S. Representative from Illinois, Mary Miller, has a brief message for you all. Hello, everyone. My name is Congresswoman Mary Miller, and I represent the Illinois 15th District in the United States Congress. I'm honored to be part of a group of such hardworking pro-life legislators. It's a privilege to work with great organizations that are doing amazing work to protect women and stop the dangerous distribution of chemical abortion drugs. People may be surprised to know doctors may not completely or adequately inform women about the real effects of chemical abortion drugs. Shockingly, there are concerted efforts to reduce the health and safety standards of the chemical abortion drugs. Clearly, this is not in the best interests of women. Women deserve to be well informed about the potential adverse health effects these drugs can have on their bodies, as well as the long-term physical and mental health risks. Why are doctors required for all other medical prescriptions to inform women about the potential risks but not when they prescribe chemical abortion drugs. The Biden administration has continued to choose political theater over promoting the health, safety, and well-being of women across the United States. While quietly expanding the chemical abortion drug market during COVID, they've used this pandemic as an excuse to appease the corporate abortion business and leave women to deal with the effects of the chemical abortion without being under the supervision of a doctor. If they really cared about women, which they claim to do and claim to serve, they would ensure that women are fully informed of the risks involved. It's not too late to turn this tide. Fighting against the expansion of chemical abortion and making our voices heard is vital. Let's work to educate women, legislators, and voters on how dangerous chemical abortion is so we can end this terrible, unsafe market and truly advocate for women. 
Appreciate that, Brooke, as well as thank you, Representative Roy, and thank you, Representative Miller. So let's begin wrapping up and let's recap what you can do right now to make a life-saving impact. In a new browser tab, I want you to open up thisischemicalabortion.com. Just spell it out, This is chemicalabortion.com. When you open that browser tab, just follow the simple instructions first to sign the petition to the Biden administration and say, we do not want death by mail. Then call upon Congress, as Congressman Roy was telling us about, particularly contact your elected officials, follow the instructions at thisischemicalabortion.com and make sure that you tell them to hold the FDA accountable to prevent reckless distribution of these deadly drugs so as to protect women and to save children. Do that right now. And then finally, it's time to make your community aware of what chemical abortion really is. They're not going to hear the truth from the secular news media. You and I have an opportunity to share the truth through this groundbreaking new docu-series. Watch the entire series yourself and then share it with everyone you know. That's how you can make a difference. So thank you for being a part of this important discussion during this webcast. May God bless you. May God bless America amidst this crisis. And now, if you're able, stay tuned, because here, for the first time ever, is the premiere of the entire new This Is Chemical Abortion docuseries. And I want to pass this year a constitutional amendment, and we'll be able to say we are protected women's rights in a way no one else has before. This is a very important step in making health care accessible during the pandemic. Any right that requires you to take extraordinary measures to access it is no right at all. What I see from the abortion industry is that they're lying to women. They're telling women that we can't be successful mothers and have a career. They're telling women that we have to pit our interests against our own children. Um, They're saying that women aren't capable and that's not empowering to women and it's not the truth. So the abortion pill is a type of non-surgical abortion, but it's also called RU46, it's called medication, medical abortion. We tend to use the phrase chemical abortion, and that's because when you hear the words medical or medicine, some kind of healing is implied. But with chemical abortion, we know that the only intention of these chemicals is to end the life of that preborn child. What we commonly refer to as the abortion pill is actually a combination of two different medications. That first medication is what actually leads to the death of her baby. What Mifeprex does is it binds to the receptor that's meant for progesterone and it blocks the action of progesterone. Then nutrients and other things essential for the baby's development are not able to get to the baby like they should be. What mesoprostol does is it induces contractions of the uterus and then eventually expel the baby and any other pregnancy-related tissues that are inside of her uterus. My experience at Planned Parenthood was cold. And to some extent, yes, I had responsibility in this. I walked into an abortion provider's office and said, I need an abortion, and that's what they gave me. So that's to be expected. But what I didn't expect to happen was to be so under-informed and really now what I think it was was misinformed. I was misinformed about what was going to happen to my body with a chemical abortion. I was told, again, this will be much like your monthly menstrual cycle. Everything I had read online, expect some bleeding, expect some cramping, we'll give you some pain medication. It was really portrayed as chemical abortion is no big deal. When a woman who is already in typically a desperate situation, right? She finds herself pregnant. She's not ready to be pregnant for whatever reason, or she thinks she might not be able to take care of that child. So she already is very vulnerable when she goes to an abortion facility. She's relying on them to give her accurate information, but oftentimes that's not what she receives. Women are told that this is just like a miscarriage, that it will be like a heavy period and that's it. 
Um, I think most women would say, even if they have heavy periods with heavy cramping, that this is not the kind of pain that would require narcotic pain medications or require medication to help with the nausea and the vomiting that occurs when, when a woman is undergoing a medication abortion. I've seen one abortion center website promising a painless process. And that, that's just, that's simply not true. That is a statement that is unsupportable and indefensible. When you watch the movie Unplanned or you listen to Abby Johnson's testimony about how her medication abortion was not what she expected it to be, that is what's consistent with what I've seen with my patients. They didn't expect the bathroom to look like a slaughterhouse from all the bleeding. They didn't expect to see the formed baby in the toilet. They didn't expect it to feel like they were in labor for a full day with no epidural. And that's not every woman's experience, but it's common enough that it is manifestly unfair for an abortion provider to tell the patient that she's just going to have a little bleeding and cramping that's no worse than a period, because that's what they're usually told. And they're usually told uh, by many sinners, when you feel it's about to come, sit on the toilet and then flush, don't look, because they don't want the woman to have the memory of seeing what is clearly a recognizable human being. So now the abortion industry gives her a pill, and then gives her a bag and tells her to go home to finish her abortion. And they're telling her she's gonna have, you know, cramping, um, she's gonna have heavy bleeding, like a bad period, and she has to go home and complete the abortion on her own. The abortion industry in this case has completely abandoned her to her own devices. They tell her, go home, you're gonna pass the product of conception in your toilet and just keep flushing. And what these young women don't understand is, how much pain do you expect? How much bleeding is too much? At what point do I look and see what am I passing? And I think that's the real abandonment here because she is not just passing a product of conception, she's passing her baby. And oftentimes they do look and they see in the toilet their baby floating there. We have heard stories about these girls picking them up and not knowing what to do with these babies, but they were told, just keep flushing, just keep flushing. I wish they told me these pills wouldn't end the baby's life. It came out in a sack with all the limbs and eyes, hearts still beating. If I knew that would be the outcome, I would have never done it. Has anyone who has had the medical abortion seen the fetus when it passed? I was nine weeks and yesterday I saw it in my pad when I went to change it and couldn't stop crying for a while. I just don't know how to feel and I wasn't expecting to see it, especially with so many details. It just broke my heart. Women undergoing abortions often are not certain about their decision. It, it is not the picture that Planned Parenthood paints where women are just know what they want to do and they just want to get it done. Women are torn, ambivalence. Sometimes all they want to hear is supportive information. And that's why these laws that so many states have passed for abortion informed consent are absolutely critical. Where a woman is actually, even if she's seeking an abortion, even if she's going to an abortion provider, is given a lot of detailed information about the development of her baby, what her baby can feel, what her baby's limbs and organs are doing. In some cases, the woman is told explicitly Abortion ends the life of a whole, separate, unique, living human being. And all of that information is important for a woman to have when she's making this decision. A woman doesn't give up her right to know the truth just because she's seeking an abortion. But that's what the abortion industry wants. And so I think their goal is to undercut the narrative about the reality of abortion. The abortion industry, I don't think it really advocates for women. Because if they were women's advocates, they would recognize the dynamic person that is sitting in front of them who's considering an abortion, but they don't. They train their counselors to do one thing and that's sell her an abortion, whether it's a surgical abortion or a chemical abortion, that's their bottom line goal. They are an industry. They spent over $60 million in uh, the political campaign for Hillary Clinton in 2016. $60 million. Parenthood was founded 100 years ago, giving women the care they need to live their lives and chase their dreams. No limits, no ceilings. They didn't spend that on women's health. They didn't spend that 
to make sure women had resources because again, they don't see the dynamic woman in front of them that just happens to be facing an unexpected pregnancy. Her life is changing and she's trying to figure out how do I change with it? The executive director of the National Women's Health Network argues making pregnant people leave the house to get pills they will ultimately take at home puts them and providers at unnecessary risk. It's just a needless burden and increases the risk of the epidemic. When people talk about the abortion pill, you might hear a lot of talk about something called REMS. Um, that can sound very confusing, but it's really not. So REM stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. And what it is, it's a method for the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, to control the use of certain medications that have the potential for very significant and severe side effects so that the benefit of those medications can be maximized. There are over 20,000 approved prescription agents in the United States today, over 20,000. Only 57 drugs have been deemed sufficiently dangerous to require what's called a REMS strategy. A REMS protocol is placed on a medication if its prescribing needs to be restricted, if certain precautions need to be taken, um, or if the provider that's providing it needs special training. Only 57 out of more than 20,000. And one of those is Mifeprex, Mifepristone, RU486, the abortion pill, whatever you want to call it. The REMS are very important because they really, they provide safeguards for women so that there's less of a chance that women will be damaged or harmed uh, or even killed by this medication. They require that a physician actually sees the patient. They require that she has um, documentation of her gestational age prior to receiving Mifeprex. They require that the woman receives informed consent about the potential side effects of Mifeprex and to know the warning and the danger signs that might exist where she would need to come in to be seen. They also require that uh, the physician rule out an ectopic pregnancy or a pregnancy that's outside of the uterus. This is something that can kill a woman if it's not diagnosed. And the unfortunate thing about ectopic pregnancy is that the symptoms that women experience when they are undergoing a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, which causes life-threatening bleeding, are very similar to the symptoms that she's told she's going to experience from a medication abortion. You know, patients who come to see me as an obstetrician, they're happy when they see their ultrasound, they want it as soon as possible, and they're excited when they get to see the baby and the heartbeat and those kinds of things. And, you know, that's always, that's fun, it's enjoyable, it's part of what I love doing. But I never really had quantified how many women are wrong on their due dates. And then I heard about the abortion industry's efforts to get the FDA to remove the REMS protocol. And I know that one of the reasons that's in place is to protect women who are wrong about their, how far along they are, about their gestational age. So I sat down and pulled my computer up and I ran a due date list. 27 of 50 were wrong on their assessment. And their gestational age was assigned by the first ultrasound that we did. 27 out of 50. That's more than 50% in my admittedly small sample, but a sample that includes people from all walks of life. That's a huge potential for women to be harmed because some of these women were two and three months off. They weren't just a few days off. They were weeks off and some were months off. And if a woman who's 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 weeks and doesn't know it and doesn't get an in-person evaluation to document that, and then she takes that first pill and then two days later she takes the second pill, she is far more likely 
to have complications. She is far more likely to have an incomplete process. And because she's much farther along, when a baby that's eight or 10 inches long comes out instead of a tiny little peanut-sized fetus, she is far more likely to be traumatized. What we've seen with the COVID excuses is more of the same, where women are just so burdened to get anything done. But moms across America were able to feed their families and get to the grocery store and cook and yes, make doctor's appointments and go safely during the pandemic. We have all figured it out together. We're wearing masks, we're distancing, we now have vaccines rolling out. We've all been able to do things safely. And if abortion is essential and they demanded to keep their doors open during the pandemic, they can't turn the argument around, say the absolute opposite, and insist that women aren't able to come to an abortion clinic during a pandemic. It's been chaos. We've had health centers flooded with calls from patients who are worried about their pa their ability to get the care that they need. That means either exposing themselves or other people to the new coronavirus. Everything has inconvenience. You don't eliminate all inconvenience um, and throw away health and safety for that. Um, I need to go to a well women's checkup. I can't do that through the mail, but I need to do it. So I have to do, deal with the inconvenience of scheduling the appointment, getting myself there. There are just things in life where you don't eliminate the inconvenience at the cost of women's health. If it is strictly a women's health issue, then if women are as entitled to safe health care as everybody else is in every other field of medicine, there are protocols that need to be followed. There are, there needs to be accountability in the abortion industry, and there's not. They fight against it at every opportunity. They fight against the inspection of their surgical facilities. No other surgical facility in the United States is exempt from being inspected by the county health department or the state medical board, but the abortion industry doesn't have to answer to those standards, and they don't want to answer to a REMS protocol either because it makes it more difficult for them to make a lot of money. When there are common sense regulations like uh, brief waiting periods for abortion, so for example, a woman gets informed consent, she's given an ultrasound, and then she has 24 hours to consider that information before undergoing the abortion procedure, Planned Parenthood and abortion providers sue to strike down those laws. Just an hour ago, a judge halted that law from going into effect on July 1st with a temporary injunction. It would have required a woman to wait 24 hours before having an abortion. Now, this is a momentary win for Planned Parenthood and the ACLU, who sued the state. It's really shocking to think that a woman wouldn't want just a brief amount of information, a brief amount of time to consider the information about the procedure. But the abortion industry challenges every single law that would slow down their profits or decrease their profit margins at all. And it's an egregious outlier in the field of medicine, where in every other area of medicine, there is great deference to state legislatures to protect the patient's health and welfare and safety. And yet in abortion, there seems to be an exception where any sort of normal health and safety regulation is viewed as, as some sort of political obstacle, when in fact it's just there to protect women and protect the life of the little human being inside of her. That's why the REMS strategy is in place, to require that the woman have an in-person evaluation where either by physical exam or ultrasound it is documented that she is as far along as she thinks she is and not farther, and that she does have a pregnancy inside the uterus and not in the fallopian tube. Those are not measures designed to make it more difficult for a woman to get an abortion. Those are measures designed to protect her health and safety. And if the abortion industry were really advocates for women, they would go along with that. But they're not. They're advocates for abortion.
Once again, the state of Indiana is being sued for passing an abortion-related law. This time, health providers say the state is forcing doctors to give false and misleading information about the option for an abortion pill reversal. Two independent physicians around the same time came up with this idea. They had patients as as medication abortion became more common, it was first approved in the year 2000 for use in the United States. So as it became more common, there were women who would go to the abortion clinic and they would take that first pill and sometimes be in tears with regret by the time they got to the parking lot. They were thinking, why did I do that? What did I do? I shouldn't have done that. So they desperately began reaching out to physicians and Dr. Matt Harrison and Dr. George Delgado both were approached uh, at around the same time uh, by patients who were in that very situation. And they didn't know anything about it. Nobody did. So they just looked into the physiology of how medication abortion works. And it's all a matter of interfering with the progesterone. So they theorized that if you add progesterone to the woman's system, increasing the amount of progesterone that's in her bloodstream, it will compete with the progesterone blocker and do what the progesterone is supposed to be doing. And so the way it works is if a woman calls the, the network hotline and she gets connected with a physician who can provide her with progesterone, she starts taking progesterone immediately. The sooner she takes it after taking Mifeprex, the better, but it needs to be taken within about 72 hours of taking Mifeprex. And then she takes progesterone every day and um, We've looked at different ways of giving the progesterone, whether it be through a shot or whether it be through a pill that she takes. And it actually appears that just taking the pill is the most effective method. Through giving progesterone, we are able to save almost 70% of babies after women have taken Mifeprex if they take progesterone, which is amazing. And because of that, today, there are more than 2,000 babies that are alive because of abortion pill reversal. So sometimes when a woman has started a chemical abortion and she's having regrets, she will call back to the abortion provider to try to seek answers of how she can possibly continue this pregnancy. But what we commonly hear from women is that the abortion provider is not helpful. They often will give her information that is untruthful and not based in science, not based in any kind of study. They are commonly told that the baby will be born with birth defects, the baby will be born with delays, and that is not based in any kind of science. There's never been a study that shows this, but it's in an effort to convince a woman to complete the abortion that she no longer desires. They also will sometimes tell them to come into the clinic to complete the abortion there, to take the misoprostol there in an effort to coerce them to finish the abortion. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about abortion pill reversal and about progesterone. I've heard it said that this is experimental, that we're experimenting on women by using a, an unproven medication or a medication that could be dangerous. Again, this is a medication that has been used for decades in the practice of OBGYN in the first trimester of pregnancy. It has a proven safety record. We are not experimenting with women's lives. We are trying to save their babies. Soon after beginning to be listed as available as a reversal provider, I got a phone call. Uh, a woman in my area, where I lived in Middle Tennessee at the time, had taken the first pill that morning uh, after her appointment at the abortion clinic and immediately felt overwhelmed with regret and remorse. Um, she called her abortion provider and was told there was nothing she could do. So she Googled it. She got on Google and typed in the term abortion pill reversal and the uh, APRN hotline number came to the top of the result, the search results. So they put her in touch with me. Um, I reviewed her medical history with her. I explained how it works, told her we couldn't promise results, asked her where she lived and offered to see her in my office for follow-up. We talked. We bonded, she came to me for prenatal care for the remainder of the delivery. And later that year, I did her scheduled repeat C-section at 39 weeks after having completed a pregnancy with no complications, no problems, nothing other than routine follow-up. 
And I asked her the morning of the delivery. I said, you, you've gotten to know me. You've seen my social media work on the, for the pro-life cause. You know a lot about what I do. Would it be okay with you if we took a picture after I'm holding the baby up in the operating room? And she said, I want to. That's a, she was thrilled that we would use her situation to share that message. That went viral, shared like more than 10,000 times, thousands upon thousands of comments and reactions. I, I have no idea. When a woman reaches out to the abortion pill reversal network, she typically is filled with immediate regret and guilt for her decision. She is connected with a nurse on the abortion pill rescue network. That nurse is there to offer her immediate support and to reassure her that she is not alone. The nurse is available to answer any questions she may have about abortion pill reversal. And if the woman decides that she would like to move forward with reversal, a medical intake is completed. Upon completion of the medical intake, the woman is sent a consent for her to read over and preview and make sure she doesn't have any questions in regards to that. If she reads the consent and she would like to begin reversal, she sends her signature to the nurse, and then the nurse locates a provider in her area that is able to help her. Once that provider is located, he contacts the woman and they immediately begin the abortion pill reversal protocol. The nurse then also connects the woman to a pregnancy help organization in her area. Those organizations are available to her to offer her ongoing support, encouragement, education, and can, they can even help with material needs that she may be in need of. So there's nothing harmful about it. Progesterone has been used in women's health care for 50 or 60 years. Any woman who is on a prescription form of birth control is taking or getting some form of progesterone every day. Postmenopausal women who are on hormone replacement therapy, if they still have their uterus, they're getting a form of progesterone every day. And with regard to pregnancy, the form of progesterone we use is used commonly to reduce miscarriage risk. In women who have had multiple miscarriages, it's used commonly to reduce the risk of preterm delivery in women who've had prior preterm deliveries. So there's nothing that they can legitimately point to that says that this experimental treatment should make you afraid because it's not safe. It's safe and it's effective. And there is no data that shows otherwise. It's very important that we get information about abortion pill reversal out into the general public. Women need to know that this is a possibility. If they change their mind, this isn't forcing women to do anything. Women who go to get a medication abortion are free to complete it if they choose to do so. But if we are about empowering women with information and giving them all of their choices, why wouldn't we want them to know that this exists? For someone that claims to be pro-choice, it is a great question for them as to why they would not support reversal, as we can all agree that progesterone has been safely used in pregnancies since the 1950s. A true advocate for women would want women to have all the information needed prior to making a decision. A true advocate would want to make sure a woman has all the truth and the facts. An informed decision is the best decision. Women deserve honesty, women deserve truth, women deserve facts, women deserve proper medical care, and women deserve to have a second chance at choosing life for their unborn child. When I was 17, I found out that I was pregnant with my first child, and I grew up in a very Christian home, got pretty good grades, was a girl that was going to college, so I knew better. But thankfully, I had a family support at that time. My son's father uh, said that he wanted to be a part of the baby's life, and I chose to parent that child. I never even considered abortion with my first baby, and thankfully, because of the support that I had. I finished high school, uh, immediately started college at a local university, and things were looking up for a girl like me, a young teen that was pregnant and, and now a mom. And less than a year later, about 
10 months after my first child was born, I found myself newly single because I had fled what was an extremely uh, toxic and verbally and physically abusive relationship. I was a freshman in college living with my baby in my parents' home. I was 18, almost 19 years old, and I actually found out that I was pregnant uh, for the second time. And this time there was no silver lining. There was no, I can do it. In fact, my dad's words kept replaying in my mind. And those words were, we've helped you so much the first time with your first baby that don't you dare get pregnant under my roof again. And oh, if you do, you will, you will be forced to leave. We will kick you and your son out. So I sat there in a dirty grocery store, public restroom, staring at a positive pregnancy test, thinking my son and I are going to lose it all. I'll have to drop out of college. There goes my future. I'm gonna be alone and broke and have no family. No one will ever love me. And abortion almost seemed like a compassionate choice, like a choice I was making for not just myself, but for the 10 month old baby, Eli, my son that I already have, uh, a compassionate choice for my parents, sparing them the pain uh, and shame and embarrassment another baby would bring on them and this family. And it wasn't, it wasn't empowerment that made me choose abortion. It was desperation. I wanted so badly uh, to go back in time and to, to take this pregnancy away, but I couldn't. And I thought abortion was the best option for a girl like me. But after I started that chemical abortion, after I took that first RU486 abortion pill, I was sent on my way with a brown paper bag. And by the time I got to my car, it was like this crisis, foggy, storm-filled lens I was trying to see through sifted and I could now very clearly see what I had just done. And I searched on my phone after praying. This time I did pray first, looking uh, for, for guidance from God. I just said, God, if there's a way out of this, please help me find it. And if not, please help me to forgive myself. And thankfully, online, I found out about abortion pill reversal, called the hotline, uh, stuck with the regimen, which was progesterone back into my body to counteract that abortion pill. And uh, of course, you know, the abortion clinic said this would never work. And it did. I carried to term. And on October 20th of 2013, I gave birth to another little boy, my second son, and he was born perfectly healthy. His name is Zachariah, which means the Lord remembers, because looking back at our situation, I can clearly see God. And God had a plan for me, even when I didn't think he did. Uh, and he was in control. And God had a plan for the child that I was carrying. So when you're working with young people, these are folks who've set a vision for their life. Um, they're working towards a particular educational goal or career goal, and they've really envisioned and planned out their life. And so when they're faced with an unexpected pregnancy, um, something that wasn't a part of their plan, they have to take that moment and we have to walk with her and take that moment with her to really mourn because it doesn't matter where you're at in life, whether you're in college, you're in a career age, you're married, you're single, your whole life as you know it, no matter what choice you make has changed. Kind of an epiphany I had, someone shared this with me, um, Peggy Hartshorn from Heartbeat International, said that when a woman is in this situation, it's like she has three bad options. Because I can parent and in my view, give up all my dreams or make all my dreams a lot harder to attain. Or I can place my child for adoption and then I'm a bad mom because I've given up my child. Or I can have an abortion, which most women understand and know ends that child's life. As women, we are capable, we are strong beings. We can do a lot of things. And to try to tell us that we have to kill our children in order to, to succeed is demeaning to us. Women are able to accomplish great things when they put their minds to it and when they have support. And so to the woman who's facing a crisis pregnancy, I would say to you that you are strong and you can do this. You can make the right choice for you and for your child. And if that choice is for you to be a parent to that child, there are resources out there that can help you with that. Or if the right choice for you is placing your child for adoption, that can be a wonderful choice for your child. Um, and that might be the right choice for you. And there's a lot of support out there for you in that choice as well. 
so many girls, they take that first pill and then they start thinking about it. Oh, what did I just do? What's about to happen to me? And the thoughts about the child inside them start invading their mind. And the abortion industry does not want them to know that there's an opportunity to save that baby's life. And when you are facing a crisis pregnancy, um, it is like you have these blinders on and all you can see is the crisis. And the abortion industry feeds off her crisis and her desperation. But there is a whole community out there ready to help her take off those blinders and see the bigger picture, like abortion pill reversal, but the abortion industry doesn't want her to see it. Why would abortion provider want to refuse to give a pregnant mother the ultrasound of her baby? Why would an abortion provider file a lawsuit so that they don't have to give a woman information about the development of the fetus inside of her? The only reason is because the abortion industry doesn't want women to choose life. They want women to go through with the abortion. So these lawsuits are frankly outrageous. The fact that abortion providers would hire teams of dozens and dozens of lawyers and go to every state in America and try to strike down almost every single abortion law on the books is shocking. And it should be horrifying to every person in America who wants to know what's this pro-choice movement really about? They're really about profits. Now, just to ask you, if you're an advocate for choice, why don't you respect the choice a woman makes when she decides she's made a mistake and she wishes she hadn't done that and she chooses to try to reverse it? Why, why will you not advocate for her then? Because you're not an advocate for choice. You're not an advocate for women. You're an advocate for abortion. That's why they lie to them like that. HB 50, 1577 would force clinicians to give patients false, misleading, and dangerous information. This false information is the idea of a so-called abortion reversal, an experimental treatment that has been soundly disproven. Not only that it is not effective, but in fact that it has dangerous and potentially deadly complications. In my personal opinion, when I think about the abortion industry and how they claim to be so pro-choice, it would make sense to me that pro-choice would include the choice to change your mind, right? The choice to then access abortion pill reversal. But that's not the case. They hate, they cannot stand APR or abortion pill reversal. And at first, I really didn't get it. I thought, why is this clinic mad that I've changed my mind? What's it to them? I owe them nothing. And I think, honestly, it comes down to a couple different things. I think one is money and profit. And I think two is the politics of abortion. And they think that if you don't 100% agree with them, then you by default are 100% against them and you must be eliminated. And that's what they're trying so hard to do with the abortion power reversal network is to eliminate it, to debunk it, to call it junk science, fake science, to say that women never regret this decision. So it's not even needed or relevant. And I think that they're gonna fail in doing that because stories like this are continuing to come out and women do regret the decision to start a chemical abortion and women are so grateful to have that second chance at choosing life for their child. And so really, if we truly cared about women, if we truly cared about them being able to make an informed choice, a key tenet of medical ethics is that people deserve to have informed consent. That means they deserve to know what all of their options are and they deserve to know the risks and the benefits of all those options and what alternatives might exist. Abortion pill reversal is an alternative to abortion when a woman has already begun an abortion and so she deserves to know about it. In hiding that fact from women, what the abortion industry is saying is that we don't trust women to make their own decisions. We want to say what's best for them. But those of us in the pro-life movement, those of us at APLOG, we are there to say that we trust women. We know that they're intelligent creatures. We know that they can make good informed choices when they're given all of the information.
an approach that seeks to protect the right to choose while reducing the number of abortions. Our vision should be of an America where abortion is safe and legal, but rare. This is a book that was based around a movement. I remember this trending online. I remember the debate that this started. Shout your abortion. You have to understand where the phrase safe, legal, and rare came from and why they began using it, which like so many of the other things that the abortion supporters use, they're just, they're meaningless sound bites that sound good, they're easy to repeat, but they don't mean anything. So when it comes to abortion, the exception always makes the rule. And when you go all the way back to the court decision, Roe v. Wade, what was that case? It was a woman who claimed that she was pregnant through rape. And it opened up the entire argument for abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy. So the exception makes the rule. Um, why was the culture and society compelled to support her? Because she had had allegedly, and turned out not really, experienced a rape situation where she got pregnant. But also, the other story that was being told in the media at the same time was, you have women dying in back alley abortions. Women using coat hangers, doing other things to self-inflict an abortion in private in their home, and how dangerous that was. And so, one, it was the exception makes the rule. You know, in the case of rape, it's okay, so let's open the door for all. But then, isn't it just so much more compassionate to offer women a, a doctor to walk with them through this process so that it can be what next became known was safe, legal, and rare? Again, we just see the hypocrisy of the abortion industry. So early on, the argument was safe, legal, and rare. Abortion should be rare, but we just want to make sure that women are safe so that they're not doing these back alley abortions, you know, by themselves in their home with a coat hanger. That was the scaremongering behind the push to legalize abortion. Now we don't hear any of that. We don't hear anything about wanting women to be under the thorough good care of a medical professional in those rare circumstances when abortion is necessary. We hear, shout your abortion. We hear, uh, should be available on demand access should be immediate. And the idea of pushing chemical abortions out over the counter would be going back to that place where women are deprived of any sort of medical care. It certainly wouldn't be safe. It would not be rare. And that actually is the goal of the abortion industry. And that's how we see that everything that comes out of their mouth, everything in, in every lawsuit that they file trying to strike down common sense health and safety laws is all for one goal, which is to expanding the number and access to abortion. Not only do you put women's lives in danger, but if it's, if it's a form you're filling out online on a website, it doesn't stop a male predator from filling that out on a woman's behalf and saying, how far along she is, what her blood type is, making up a name, making up whatever information he has to make up so that he can have that drug mailed to her. Again, the abortion industry doesn't care about her health or her safety, or they would not allow these doors to be opened up. What we've seen is stories where the fathers of unborn children have slipped the drug to the pregnant mother and caused abortions without her consent, without her knowing, without her choice. It is a local story that has been shocking the nation. A boyfriend charged with tricking his pregnant girlfriend into taking an abortion pill resulting in their unborn child's death. The other context is in se sex trafficking. So in sex trafficking, one thing we know is that the traffickers take their victims to obtain abortions because so long as the victim is pregnant or visibly pregnant, she is out of commission and the trafficker can't make his money off of her. There is a high percentage of trafficking victims who undergo repeat abortions over and over again, coerced under duress without their consent. So if chemical abortions were widely available without prescription, without a doctor's visit, 
those sex traffickers, we can be sure, are going to be ordering those pills in bulk online and administering them to their victims, perpetuating this cycle of enslavement and sexual abuse of young women, often young girls. It's essentially a way to facilitate sex trafficking, to allow chemical abortions to be bought on demand by mail without any sort of medical oversight. What's well, a scary prospect to think about REMS being removed and abortion pill being something that's on demand, available by mail, available online, available in vending machines on college campuses. This is what the abortion industry wants. This is what Planned Parenthood and their allies are pushing for. And so we know what the goal is. We know what the future of the abortion pill is going to look like if it's up to Planned Parenthood and abortion providers. Another reason why it's important that the REMS stay in place for Mifeprex is because it ensures the safety of women and it ensures that complications are followed and tracked. One, it makes sure that a woman is connected to a physician who gives her the, the pills for the medication abortion, and then she has someone that she knows she can go to see for follow-up. We know that medication abortions have a four times higher complication rate than surgical abortions do. We also know that women are at an increased risk of infection from medication abortions, and so they need very close follow-up to be able to monitor for symptoms of that infection or to have someone to see if they do have signs of an infection. If you're facing an unplanned pregnancy and you don't know what to do, don't start by going to an abortion provider who, like a used car salesman, is just going to try to sell you a procedure that makes money for them. Go to a place that really cares about you and the baby. Because despite what the abortion industry says to you about the accusations that pro-life people are just forced birthers who just want to make you have the baby and then don't care about you afterwards, that's simply not true. There are over 3,000 pro-life pregnancy centers all across the country. Virtually no woman anywhere in the country is more than an hour's drive away from the closest pro-life pregnancy center. These are places where people will welcome you. They will listen to your story. You matter to them. And, and there are so many implications to such a difficult decision. But come talk to somebody that really cares for you who is not in it for the money because these pro-life pregnancy centers are not going to accept one dime from you, and they're never going to ask you for anything. They are there for you. Start there. I have talked to a lot of women who have been in unplanned crisis pregnancies who feel the exact way that I did. They're scared. They are trying to see through a foggy, storm-filled lens. They're not thinking uh, clearly. And what I found is that the ones that choose life never regret it. And the ones that choose abortion in some way, shape, or form go on to either regret it or to be heavily impacted and affected by it in their life. And it breaks my heart that they were manipulated and lied to uh, during a time where they were vulnerable and scared. And so if you or someone you know is watching this and are experiencing an unplanned pregnancy, Please know that there are ministries, there are nonprofits, there are pregnancy centers, there are people even at your church, your high school, your college, wherever you are, there are people in your community that want to love on and support and pray for you and your child. And that abortion is not the only choice accessible to you.